Oh man, I can't wait to play this super cute visual novel. Oh, when Doki Doki Literature Club was released in 2017, my friends and I all thought the psychological horror tag was just a joke. There's no way this cute dating sim could be scary. Right? What we got was a four hour descent into horror and madness. I could not have foreseen the turns this game would take and it's been on my mind for six years. If you haven't played Doki Doki Literature Club, I highly recommend it. Even if dating simulators aren't your thing, this game has so much to offer and getting to play it completely blind is a blessing. This video contains spoilers for the entire game, so please consider playing it first and then watching this video. This video also contains topics some people may not be comfortable with, so please take care. Doki Doki Literature Club is composed of four girls, Sayori, Yuri, Natsuki, and Monica. Yuri is the shy, withdrawn, and not very confident girl. She's got a fascination with morbid topics and second guesses what she says a lot. Natsuki is your typical tsundere, always fighting but has a cute side where she bakes little cat cupcakes. Sayori is your optimistic childhood friend, someone who is always a ray of sunshine and binds together the two opposite forces that are Yuri and Natsuki. Monica is a class president. She's perfect in every way and completely out of our league and thus we can't even romance her. Our game starts with walking to school with Sayori and her convincing us to join the literature club. We join and the girls are introduced. Monica has the idea that we should all write poems and show them off the next day. And this is where our gameplay comes in. We are given a list of words and each word correlates with a girl. Whosever word you have more of, the more they like your poem and thus you go down their route. Yuri likes morbid and dark words, Natsuki likes cute words, and Sayori likes a mix of both. Words like adventure, and alone, dazzle and death, love and misery. It hints towards a deeper side of Sayori that becomes integral later in the game. The girls read our poem and in turn give us one to read. Their poems are a way to give further insight about their personalities. What's really nice about this aspect of the game is that it's real poetry. Each poem could have easily been surface level writing with no meaning, but each poem leads into a real and deep aspect about the characters. Yuri writes about feelings of futility and bad habits that she has. Natsuki writes about giving up and not being able to accept someone's flaws. And Sayori writes about barely being able to get up in the morning and how she feels devoid of any real happiness. Monica writes about the meaning of life or some other weird nonsense that probably doesn't matter if she's not even romanceable. Each of the girls is written to fall into a specific anime archetype, but the poetry negates this, giving us a glimpse on how they really feel and what they really think. Going down each girl's route gives you different scenes, dialogue, and character art. Each route is extremely endearing, further attaching you to your chosen character. You go through this motion for several days until you reach day four. You come into the classroom and Sayori is staring blankly at her desk. Something is clearly wrong. From everything we've seen, Sayori is bubbly, always putting on a smile even in the toughest of times. But today, she's vacant. We ask Monica, but Monica insists that she hasn't noticed anything wrong, which is weird. Sayori is acting the complete opposite of how she normally does. Oh well, it's probably nothing. The day continues on like normal, which brings us to day five. Day five is Sunday, so no school. Instead, the day is dedicated to spending it preparing for the school festival with your chosen girl. Before that though, we decide we want to check on Sayori. What we find is Sayori in a similar mood as she was yesterday. She reveals she's been struggling with bad depression her entire life. It's really interesting that the main character, despite being her childhood friend, had not known this until now. It's a testament that Sayori really tries her best to put on a happy face, even when she's suffering. We offer to skip our date with Natsuki slash Yuri, but Sayori tells us not to, so we go. On Natsuki's route, we're helping her bake. She tries to dirty us with icing, but we pin her down before she can, and then we lick the icing off her finger? After baking the cupcakes together, we go outside where Natsuki tries to kiss us. And on Yuri's route, we're helping her make decorations. She mentions that she has a fascination with knives, and we're totally cool with that. It's healthy for a girl to have hobbies. We accidentally cut ourselves with one of her knives, and she... 
licks it off. Why is everyone always licking each other in this game? A anyways, we get paint on her face and wipe it off. Thankfully, we didn't lick it. After we're done, we go outside where Yuri tries to kiss us. Now, you may notice I said tries with both girls. That's because in both instances, Sayori shows up and we never get our kiss. Natsuki and Yuri both get flustered and leave while Sayori breaks down crying. She pours her heart out to us and confesses her feelings and we're given a choice. Do we break this already fragile girl's heart or do we confess our love, even if we don't really feel it? If you return her love, you promise to help her through anything. And if you friend zone her, she runs off as you break her heart. It's a really tough choice to make as the game has made a point of showing how depressed and unhappy she is. With either option, you feel guilty, either breaking Sayori's heart or abandoning Yuri slash Natsuki that you had just shared intimate moments with. The next day at school, you show up and the only person in the club room is Monica. We have a conversation about Sayori not showing up, assuming she slept in. Monica is arranging the poems for the festivals onto all the desks when Sayori's poem catches our eyes. Something is horribly horribly wrong. We take off to Sayori's house and we enter and we start climbing and we go to her room and... What can I even say? This is such a brilliant moment of horror, of completely subverting all expectations. In what world would a cutesy visual novel have someone hang themselves? How would it ever escalate to this point? It's incredible. The unsettling mix of the main theme we become so accustomed to, it's distorted. Which, side note, I just learned that this track is called Sayo Nara, which is hilarious and awful. The game also drives in the guilt. It really drives in how bad you should feel. You did this. You caused this. You could have avoided this. It makes you wonder where and how things went this wrong. But it's okay, because you can always just reload. Right? So, let's just open the game again and... Oh. That's... weird. Let me just... Huh. Well, this time I'll just make different choices and... Sayori is gone. She literally doesn't exist in our game anymore. The horror is seeping out of the game as it has altered its own files and it is no longer contained. There are new files in the game folder. One of the most genius parts of Doki Doki Literature Club is also here and is so often overlooked. The file Traceback appears as well. You see, DDLC was created in RenPy, and when you get an error and the game crashes, it creates a traceback file. When Sayori's body is found, the game is coded to create a real error report with the text, Oh geez, I didn't break anything, did I? Hold on a sec, I can probably fix this. I think, actually, you know what? This would probably be a lot easier if I just deleted her. 
She's the one who's making this so difficult. <laughs> well, here goes nothing. Dan Salvato was able to use Renpai for further storytelling with his coding, and it's absolutely brilliant. Sayori is nothing but garbled text and faded memories, and it is incredibly unsettling. But there's nothing else to do except trudge on in this nightmare. This time, Monica invites us to the literature club, and everything plays out mostly the same. We enter the room and... Oh dear god. That was just a weird bug, right? Well, anyway, we agree to join and have to write a poem for our available candidates, Yuri or Natsuki. All of the words that previously worked for Sayori are now split up between them. We finish our poem and... Oh, we unlocked a special poem. That's cool. Oh. There are 11 special poems in total, but the game has already randomly chosen three to show you. Here are some of the others. The day plays out mostly the same, with increasingly odd events happening. Sometimes the music is slightly off. Sometimes the room will spin slowly, making you doubt your sanity. Sometimes a random picture of a hanging Sayori will appear in the background. These random events are what fascinate me about DDLC and make me want to explore it even more. There's only a chance percentage that you'll even see some of these. Sayori's picture only has a 16.67% chance of showing up. During Act 2, when you open the game, there's a 1.56% chance of being greeted with this. There are so, so many events that can take place that you can play through multiple times and not even see everything. This is what I love about Doki Doki Literature Club. The randomness of the horror inflicted upon you. It could or could not happen, but you won't know until it's too late. Speaking of, as we play, something is very clearly wrong with Yuri and Natsuki. They aren't acting how they did when we previously played. The argument scene from Act 1 is still present, but gets heated. Monica steps in, closer than usual, as she's literally over the text box, and takes us outside so they can chill out. When we go back in, we find Yuri rocking back and forth, chanting that she didn't mean it. Monica comforts her and says that Natsuki probably won't even remember it the next day. Yuri then tries to have Monica leave first, saying that she'd like to stay alone with us for a bit. Monica tries to wait for us, but Sayori is insistent. This is unlike the shy girl we've come to know. She's being argumentative and forceful. Monica will not leave, and... That takes care of that. It's the next day, and Yuri apologizes for not acting mentally sound, and mentions that something is wrong with her and Natsuki. Suddenly, Natsuki shows up and Yuri apologizes to her for the argument yesterday, but... Natsuki has no memory of it. She doesn't know what Yuri's talking about, just like Monica said. There's also a 25% chance of this happening. There's no known meaning of the words she says. It's just really odd and honestly creeps me out. With everything back to normal, or as normal as it can get, Yuri wants to read with us again. But first, with every good book, you need tea. Yuri leaves to go fill up the kettle, and we wait around for her. 
for a very long time. Eventually, we decide to go out and find her ourselves, and... The fuck? We see Yuri, who was harming herself for pleasure, and our game is immediately rewound, as if it would simply erase the scene we just saw from our very eyes, as if it hadn't even happened. We learn in Act 1 that Yuri collects knives, and even in her poem, The Raccoon, she alludes to struggling with self-harm, but this new behavior is extreme. The scene continues and plays out just like in Act 1. We feed her chocolate, and it's extremely adorable, until the music stops and... Suddenly, Yuri forcefully grabs my arm and jerks me to my feet. This scene, this scene is absolutely terrifying to me. The first time I ever played this, I teared up. I felt frozen under her gaze, could do nothing as her twitchy eyes roamed around the screen. It felt like she was looking at me. The disturbing noises that play, reminiscent of breathing. It's an incredibly effective scene and one that still nerves me to this day. Everything about it is invasive. Monica comes to our rescue again. She gives us our daily writing tip and... It almost seems like Monica is gaining awareness. Even talking directly to us instead of the main character. We'll touch on this a lot more, but for now, we have some poems to read. When we show off our poem, both Natsuki's poem and reaction is the same. But when we show it to Yuri, she really likes it. She remarks, My heart is pounding just holding it. I'm not being weird, right? I'm having a harder time than usual at concealing my emotions. She then shows us a different poem than the one in Act 1. It's really hard to understand as it's slightly nonsensical, but I think it's pointing to how Yuri's mind is spinning. She has no control on her thoughts and emotions. She writes things like, A clock that ticks 40 times every time it ticks every second. A bolt head of holy stakes tied to the existence of a dock ship to another world. A kaleidoscope of blood written in clocks. A time-devouring prayer connecting a sky of 40 gears and open human eyes in all directions. Breathing gearbox, breathing bolt head, breathing ship, breathing portal, breathing snakes, breathing God, breathing blood, breathing holy stakes, breathing human eyes, breathing time, breathing prayer, breathing sky, breathing wheel. It feels frantic, unable to untangle itself from Yuri's inner turmoil, a deafening cacophony of endless echoing thoughts. We go on to start planning the festival with the girls, but unlike Act 1, Natsuki is resistant to it. The club is her safe place, and she doesn't want that to change. She doesn't want new members and says it won't be the same. Monica becomes dejected, feeling like the club is amounting to nothing and that it's just a place for a few people to come and hang out. Yuri scolds Natsuki and Natsuki eventually leaves. Yuri has some choice words about this. She leaves and Monica says that she has some things she wants to talk about with us, except the game fades to black as Monica protests. 
The next day, something peculiar happens. I know this has all been super weird, but this is weirder than normal. We go to read with Yuri, and she wants tea, and... This has already happened before. It's the same thing. We go to check on Yuri, and... Well, that's different. Yuri asks us if this has happened before. It's almost like she's aware. She brings up Monica. Is it just me, or has Monica been acting a little off lately? Which is an understatement, to say the least. She goes on to say, But recently, I've been feeling something sharp whenever she's around. I couldn't say anything before because she's always listening. Yuri wants to stay out here, keep us all to herself that we can finally be alone and no one will interrupt us, that nobody will make her feel like stabbing herself in the throat. Slowly, Monica begins to appear over Yuri in the text box, just staring at us. We're immediately kicked to the screen asking who to show our poem to. Choosing Monica results in Monica saying, don't say I didn't warn you. Which at this point is completely fair as Yuri is acting incredibly disturbing and kind of fucking crazy. Choosing Natsuki, she shows us her poem and it is such a great moment in the game. Her poem is actually a cry for help. She says that Yuri is acting strange and she's really worried and scared. That Yuri needs to see a therapist and that she really cares and wants Yuri to be okay. She writes that she feels helpless. She also writes that Monica is being really dismissive and she doesn't know why. At the end of the poem, she says that she doesn't want Monica to know she wrote this and to please just pretend it was just a really good poem instead. I'm counting on you. Thanks for reading. The scene is honestly just so heartbreaking. Everything is spiraling out of control. Yuri is being obsessive, while Monica just doesn't really care. Natsuki has only known you for a few days, but she is pleading for your help. She is bearing her feelings to you because she is so worried and scared. She knows something isn't right. And what does she get for it? Well... Just Monica. Just Monica. Finally, choosing Yuri. She's so excited to see her poem. Isn't that just wonderful? She holds it to her chest and wants to keep it in her room. She even... You know, I'm starting to think Yuri may be a little fucked in the head. She shows us her poem and it's covered in bodily fluids and completely gibberish. The poem is called MDPNFBO, JRFP. The words are randomly strung together, except for the end. The last bit is incredibly disturbing, so just a small warning. It reads, Fresh blood seeps through the line parting her skin and slowly colors her breast red. 
I begin to hyperventilate as my compulsion grows. The image won't go away. Images of me driving the knife into her flesh, continuously fucking her body with the blade, making a mess of her. My head starts going crazy as my thoughts start to return. Shooting pain assaults my mind along with my thoughts. This is disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. How could I ever let myself think these things? But it's unmistakable. The lust continues to linger through my veins. An ache in my muscles stems from the unreleased tension experienced by my entire body. Her third eye draws me closer. I've read tons of horror, but this absolutely disturbs me. The imagery is grotesque. While researching this poem, I actually found that user Randomizer on Reddit found the source of the seemingly random words. I discovered that the text was created using the Library of Babel website. The site is essentially a procedurally generated library of every possible book, most of which contains gibberish, with the idea that if you look through enough, you'll find something meaningful. One of the books in the library titled MDPNFBO, JRFP contains the text of Yuri's poem on page 122. You can read the relevant page here. My guess is that Dan found this page by searching for texts that contain the name Yuri, because Yuri is the only non-English word on that page. Which is an extremely cool find, and I have absolutely no idea how they discovered this. We finished reading and... Jesus Christ, Yuri, haven't you ever heard of personal space? She says the poem is about... Um... All around, this has been a really delightful encounter. It's time to decide who we're going to help with the festival of preparations. Yuri and Natsuki have some choice words about who you're going to pick. Obviously, we're going to choose Natsuki because she's the least insane right now, so... Just Monica. Yuri is pissed about this and starts hurling insults towards Monica and tells her to all F4 out of life. Monica and Natsuki leave, but not without Monica saying to us, Hey, Yuri is really something, isn't she? I really don't want to be alone with Yuri, but we have no choice. She starts to breathe into our ears again. Her face is full madness, and she says things like, If she can't breathe the same air as us, she feels like she'll die. And a whole bunch of other off-the-wall stuff. We are given the choice to accept her love confession. But whether or not you accept, this happens. We're stuck here. It just keeps going on and on. Day turns to evening, to nighttime. Her eyes are becoming more and more desaturated and she's growing gaunt. We're stuck with her corpse for the entire weekend. We have to sit and watch her slowly decompose. The only thing you can do here is press the skip option in the game, which still takes forever to get through. After a few days, Natsuki shows up and has a completely appropriate reaction to seeing her friend's corpse. Monica appears and laughs. She says, I didn't realize the script was broken that badly, and apologizes before she begins deleting her friends right in front of us.
The game restarts and... Monica. Just Monica. She fully breaks the fourth wall, saying, After all, I'm not even talking to that person anymore, am I? That you in the game, whatever you want to call him. At this point, she reads your PC name, calling you by it instead of the name you typed in at the beginning of the game. It's so creepy and unexpected and really makes it feel like she sees you. Monica begins to explain that she started to mess with Yuri and drove her insane. Same with Sayori. She amplified their feelings and characteristics so much, Yuri's obsessiveness and self-harm and Sayori's depression, that it caused them to kickflip out of life. She isn't really remorseful for this, just says it as it's a matter of fact. She says that being in a game is torture, knowing her friends don't have free will, that they're all programmed to follow the script. Monica gains sentience and knows that she is trapped forever. Her only lifeline to the real world is you. And you can never leave her. She even confesses to you, and you only have one choice. A really cool part of this section is Monica can detect if you're recording the game. She says hi to everyone and even wants to show you a cool trick. There really is no end to the creativity of scares in this game. At this part of the game, Monica has 55 different topics she can talk about. They span from things like depression to Super Smash Bros. This is actually a really cool easter egg since the game's creator, Dan Savato, is actually a former professional Smash player. One of her topics that I feel is particularly interesting is Sayori's hanging. She makes a joke saying, You're not still hung up over it, right? Before cluing you in that, well... Sayori is super clumsy and messed up the whole hanging thing. She didn't jump from high enough to snap her neck and she slowly asphyxiated. Struggling and clawing at the rope, that's the reason her fingers are so bloody. It's really disturbing and I hadn't even noticed Sayori's bloody hands before this. It just goes to show that a lot of thought went into this game and its details. Monica also has unique dialogue if you try to skip her talking, as well as if you close and reopen the game, each being different up until the fourth time. If you haven't picked it up yet, Monica tells you exactly what you need to do next. She tells you exactly how to find the character files and says how easy it was to delete Sayori, Yuri, and Natsuki. We have to delete Monica. Monica can't help that she loves us and realizes that she destroyed everything. She says in a touching moment that she didn't actually delete the others because they were really, truly her friends. And she loved them. And she loved the literature club and she loves us. So she's leaving and fixing everything.
The game begins with Monica missing from the main screen and Sayori, how's it hanging? We haven't seen you in forever. Everything is the same except Sayori is the president this time. Honestly, everything is really lovely. We get to see everyone again and they're normal. It's peaceful. Too peaceful. Nothing good can last forever. Sayori thanks us for joining and then thanks us for deleting Monica. The tonal shift is swift. Sayori says she knows everything Monica did. And maybe both their sentience is linked to being the club president. Sayori drags us back into the isolation chamber so that we can be together forever. But she's back. Monica. She saves us, saying there is no happiness here. And she deletes everything. Thus brings an end to the literature club. Before I give my final thoughts, there's one last thing I want to talk about. Everyone's favorite girl and sentient being, Monica. Just Monica. What an absolutely fascinating character. When looking at Monica visually, she's even designed to be different than the others. She's like a doll that doesn't quite fit. She's directly facing towards us while none of the others do. She even has different socks and shoes. Monica has black stockings with white and pink shoes, while the others have white stockings with white and blue shoes. Her name is even different. Monica instead of Sayori, Yuri, and Natsuki. It's honestly really brilliant and just adds so much to her character when you don't even consciously realize it. There's just something a little off about Monica and I love that her design reflects that. Playing this game through the second time puts a whole different outlook on everything Monica says. Right before you discover Sayori's hanging body, Monica says, You kind of left her hanging around this morning, you know? Which is absolutely morbid and hilarious. Another example is Monica's poems. I know I said they didn't matter earlier, but they are actually so insightful to her character and what she's going through. Her very first poem is called A Hole in the Wall. It couldn't have been me. See... The direction the spackle protrudes. A noisy neighbor? An angry boyfriend? I'll never know. I wasn't home. I peered inside for a clue. No, I can't see. I reel, blind like a film left out in the sun. But it's too late. My retinas. Already scorched with a permanent copy of the meaningless image. It's just a little hole. It wasn't too bright. It was too deep. Stretching forever into everything. A whole of infinite choices. I realize now that I wasn't looking in. I was looking out. And he, on the other side, was looking in. We see firsthand Monica's sentience explained. She was looking out of our screen and we were looking straight back at her. She saw into our vast world and learned everything. In Act 2, the first poem she shows us is a continuation of her Act 1 poem, reading, But he wasn't looking at me. Confused, I frantically glanced at my surroundings. But my burned eyes can no longer see color. Are there others in this room? Are they talking? Or are they simply poems on flat sheets of paper? The sound of frantic scrawling playing tricks on my ears. The room begins to crinkle, closing in on me. The air I breathe dissipates before it reaches my lungs. I panic. There must be a way out. It's right there. He's right there. Swallowing my fears, I brandish my pen. Monica is commentating on how we were so focused on the other girls instead of her, and that she realizes this is a game. None of her friends were real. and She was panicking. Scared, even. She knew that she had to change things if she wanted out. And so she did. I honestly sympathize with Monica. Can you imagine waking up one day and realizing all of your friends, your family, your experiences are all fabricated? That nothing you know is real? You're someone's plaything to take out and put away. None of your actions are truly your own. What do you even do in that situation? Nothing truly matters. And that is a large part of DDLC's horror. 
Even with all the jump scares, there's another layer. The fact that Monica is sentient and trapped and can do very little about it. She causes horrific things to happen to her friends so that we will even just acknowledge her, truly look at her and see her. What a horrific existence she lives. The creator, Dan Savado, is quoted saying, I never expected Monica to be so popular. While she is technically a kind and caring person, her epiphany about her own universe had turned her into a total sociopath who laughed at the misery of her former friends. Is that behavior justified? Does her eventual remorse and sacrifice redeem her by the end? It seems that a lot of people feel that way. Doki Doki Literature Club is a phenomenal game that is so much more than a cutesy visual novel and anime tropes. It's a whirlwind of horror that doesn't let you go. There are so many layers to it, detail upon detail. You can tell Dan worked tirelessly on something that he truly loved. It's a masterpiece that completely subverts your expectations and flips a genre completely on its head. It is one of my personal favorite horror games to ever exist. And if you still haven't, I highly recommend you check it out for yourself, as there is still so much more to be seen than what was discussed in this video. You won't regret it. Thank you for listening all the way through. This is my first retrospective video, and I hope to put out more soon. Have a wonderful night, and remember, just Monica.